The fact is, we had four dead Americans. Was it I because understand. of a protest, or was it because of guys out for a walk one night who decided they'd go kill some Americans? What difference at this point does it make? The committee's labors to uncover what happened prior, during, and after the attack matter. It matters to me personally, and it matters to my colleagues. <clears throat> Scenes from two emotional hearings and on Benghazi, including one this week. Let's introduce our roundtable. George Will, Washington Post columnist Ruth Marcus, General James Cartwright, former vice chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and ABC's chief White House correspondent John Carl. John, you broke the story this week of the emails. What's the fallout? Well, you know, clearly there's a credibility question that the White House has to deal with because this directly contradicts what they have said about this. But, you know, Martha, you mentioned in the interview with Senator Reid that the White House has tried to have it both ways, both saying that they immediately called it uh, an act of terror and saying they couldn't do that in these talking points because they couldn't prejudice the investigation. Uh, you know, there, there's problems on both sides with this. But there is one very important point here, which is in all 12 revisions of these talking points, originally drafted by the CIA, they begin by saying that the attack in Benghazi started as a spontaneous reaction to Cairo. That was demonstrably false. And took false, out all of the Al-Qaeda references. Uh, and then they went on and they took out all of the Al-Qaeda references. But they would say they didn't know that at the time. Right. About, about those. How about CIA Director David Petraeus? How did he respond to these talking points, well, and I know you have new information on that. Yeah, th th this is fascinating because Mike Morell, who was the deputy director, was the one that ultimately uh, signed off on this. When Petraeus finally saw the final version of the talking points, this is the Saturday afternoon before uh, Susan Rice's appearances on the Sunday shows, he looks at these and says that they're essentially useless. And, and direct quote from his email, he says, I would just as soon not use them but it's their call, meaning the White House's call. And they got those talking points out there. George Will, is this going to last? Is this going to have a lasting effect? Is an unacceptable way to do business at the White House? Lasting. A week ago, Mr. Carney, whose usefulness to this administration is diminishing rapidly, a week ago he said Benghazi was a long time ago, as though it was the Punic Wars. Now, this is a very live issue because we now know three things. We know that Mr. Hicks, the night of the attack, speaking from Libya, said pretty much what it was, an armed insurrection, not a movie review conducted with rocket propelled grenades and mortars. Five days later on this program and on four other Sunday morning programs, the idea of an exceptionally boisterous movie review was still the administration's uh, position. And then 14 days after the attack at the UN, it was the same thing. We started out with three arguments. Was, was security lax in Benghazi? Demonstrably. Could forces have been got there to rescue them? Doubtful. Has the nation been systematically misled? Certainly. Now we need a select committee in Congress because the State Department's misnamed Accountability Review Board neglected to in interview even the Secretary of State. You think Secretary? Clinton will be back on the Hill. Um, and possibly some of her aides, Cheryl Mills, for example, her chief of staff, who dressed down Greg Hicks uh, after he spoke to a congressman without a lawyer slash minder present. I think it's important to go back to some first principles, and George alludes to some of them. The real scandal here is what that accountability review board found, which is that security was grossly inadequate and that there were systemic failures of leadership. The notion that this is an impeachable offense, I thought Senator McCain was right in saying that that, that rhetoric has gone way, way too far. So there's a real scandal, and then there's a manufactured scandal. And by manufactured, I mean that the White House has given the building blocks of the manufacture to its opponents. I don't understand what it was thinking when it failed to understand, failed to say act of terror clearly, failed to get the story straight. And then the comments by Jay Carney that, as you say, are demonstrably false, that no single syllable was changed except for this one word. Not true. Gen General Cartwright, I want to ask you some practical questions here, because one of the things the committee looked at, or the review board, rather, was whether they could have gotten assets in there, whether they could have gotten airplanes in there. You, you heard Senator McCain say, why didn't they just shoot a fighter jet over the area to, to warn them? Was that feasible? And if not, why not? 
Um, it probably wasn't feasible. I, I don't know the exact conditions, but to get an aircraft ready, to get crews ready, to get maintenance people out, you don't just walk up to one of these and put the keys in. To provide ordnance for those w aircraft so they could at least defend themselves, and then to find the route down there, get the clearances to go in, et cetera. That's, that's a day or two of activity. So we've heard a couple of different estimates from a couple of hours. That's the flight time to get there. And then we've heard nine to 20 hours to have the aircraft actually make it. That's talking about getting them ready and getting people actually in a position. But is there something to be said that they didn't have anything there is, ready in, a, in an area like Libya, in and, an area that was still hot? And I think uh, that's where the review committee, um, Mike Mullen and uh, Tom Pickering, took a look at, you know, were the, were the measures that were available at the embassy itself sufficient? And then were the measures of the, of the forces that could come to the aid of some kind of an infraction, whether it be an, an IED and an explosive device, or whether it be an attack on the embassy or its people, those types of capability were set back in the States, in Europe, in northern Italy for aircraft. And so the question is, were they close enough? Were they ready enough to do that? That's, that's worth going back and reviewing. I, I, I want to move to Syria. And you heard all the talk about red lines. Ruth, should the president have, have made a red line with Syria? I mean, does, is his credibility seriously hurt here if he does nothing? Uh, if he does nothing. Um, I do think we should watch that space. It's not yet clear that nothing will be done. But it is also clear, look, every parent knows if you are going to make a threat, you need to be willing to follow through on it or else you lose credibility, not just with the child that you're threatening, but with the other kids that you have in your family. In this case, Iran is watching. And so he said red line. He is now looking for, to some extent, the witch's broomstick to switch metaphors to the Wizard of Oz uh, in terms of absolute proof and chain of custody and everything. But if, if there is adequate proof, and there is no consequence, but, then there is a very big loss of credibility, John, which is not to say that it's an easy choice because yeah. the, the consequences are all unpleasant, something you should have thought of months ago. John, and, and I have to say, hanging over all of this is the failure in Iraq. And this president is not going to go uh, get involved in a significant way militarily uh, in the Middle East in a war over intelligence on WMD. I talked to a very senior official uh, in the White House yesterday about this who said, look, the intelligence that uh, chemical weapons was used uh, is, is solid, uh, but you know what? It's not as solid as the intelligence that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction. Boy, that's saying something there. That that General Cartwright, let, let me go solid. to you on this. You, you, you heard John McCain say the military can always find a way not to do something if they don't want to do it. And the military clearly does not want to put up a no-fly zone, doesn't think it works. Well, what Why wouldn't it work? Why wouldn't what John McCain said work? You know, the question is, why do you want a, a no-fly zone? To do what? A no-fly zone in and of itself is probably not going to change the dynamic drastically. The no-fly zone, if you could in place one and, and you were willing to take the risk of doing and it. And sometimes when you're trying to stop the killing, you have more killing. You have more killing. And so they might be able to reduce the amount of offensive air that Assad is able to muster against the rebels. That would be potentially what a no-fly zone could do. But a no-fly zone might enable, and I think this is where Senator McCain's going, getting rid of runways, getting rid of air defenses, et cetera. But that's, that's a slippery slope. If you convince Assad that they Slippery slope, George? It is. I mean... <clears throat> seems to me you're absolutely right that there's an illusion here that a superpower can tiptoe on little cat's feet into a sectarian civil war and not change the dynamic fundamentally and not become a chief protagonist. As soon as we intervene, we are the chief protagonist. And we would be intervening in this context. The Secretary of State, Mr. Kerry's policy, it seems to me, is to get a negotiated transition of power. There are two problems with this. Assad isn't interested. He doesn't want to go anywhere. And the other side isn't interested. And the Russians who have to be involved in this aren't interested. So no one's interested in our policy. So we fall back on the illusion that some surgical, tiny intervention can be kept both surgical and tiny, and that's dangerous. We'll leave it at that, George Will.